Hello and welcome back. Um, we'll now be moving on to our next session on uh, issues related to planning and implementation. Um, again, we will uh, reflect on what we've heard in the previous webinar on this topic, and then we'll have a panel discussion um, after that. So uh, next slide, please. But joining us today um, for this panel will be Dr. Anuj Mehta, who's Assistant Professor of Medicine at Denver Health and uh, Hospital Authority in the University of Colorado in National Jewish Health, and Shandine Wood, who is a Health System Epidemiologist and Tribal Liaison for, New York, for the New Mexico uh, Department of Health. And we'll start off with a presentation by Dr. Mehta. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Toner. And I wanna thank all the members of the Academy and especially this planning group. Um, uh, not all of us could be here today, but everyone contributes to this presentation. And, and what I think was really a fantastic conversation about planning and implementation of crisis standards of care. Um, you know, this, I'm giving this presentation on the heels of some fantastic opening remarks and, and, and really insightful ideas about consideration of staffing. So I'm hoping I kind of live up to that messaging. Um, and what I want to talk about really is reflecting on some of the challenges that we identified around planning and implementation of crisis standards of care. And then in the last couple of minutes of the presentation, think about what are opportunities looking forward. If I've learned one thing, and I've learned many things from this pandemic, but if I've learned one really important thing is at some point in the future, we will face another crisis. Um, and hopefully it won't be as long or be as dire um, as this one, but again, what can we learn from this crisis to inform the ongoing crisis, but then also looking forward? So when we uh, presented at our initial webinar, we focused on this idea of plans converting that into reality. And we looked at implementation case studies, which we'll talk about in a second, workforce preparation challenges. And I, and I think we heard a lot about that from the staffing group, not only um, in thinking about how do we prepare the workforce for implementation of crisis standards of care, but also how do we retain them? How do we deal with the fact that we're missing large per, um, groups in our workforce? At this point, a lot of it's due to burnout, um, and, but you can imagine in another crisis, you could uh, imagine healthcare workers becoming ill from the, from the disease. Luckily, it, you know, I think that a lot of healthcare workers originally um, did fall ill to this disease, but we're seeing less and less of that with um, vaccines. I think there's a lot of decision-making challenges and we've seen a lot of debates about how you triage patients for ventilators. How do you choose one patient or the other with um, hot debates from a variety of, of, uh, of um, interested stakeholders. Um, so how do you make these really difficult decisions um, for things that you can anticipate such as ventilator shortages, but also how do you guide decisions for things you can't anticipate um, for a crisis that may evolve and change over time? And then how do you really uh, take into account public and stakeholder uh, perceptions um, to make sure that the plans that are implemented have at least some input from uh, the people um, whom they're going to affect? And really what we, what we highlighted was that situational awareness um, must drive a lot of the decision making related to crisis standards of care development and planning um, around declaration and activation implementation and then evaluation and monitoring and situational awareness, I think, is going to be a theme that we're going to talk about something that the healthcare field and public health in general is not necessarily the best at um, or hasn't mastered yet um, knowing on the on the ground situational awareness of utiliza utilization of resources and um, adequacy of staffing. So one of the things that I think uh, we learned from our initial presentation was that community engagement is a really important part of crisis standards of care and probably a very underrepresented or underappreciated part of planning. When we think about crisis standards of care, we typically have uh, healthcare providers of a variety of fields, um, ethicists, palliative care physicians, government um, individuals, public health officials, but oftentimes the public are the ones that, are, that don't have a seat at the table. And so community engagement is really critical to build trust early, um, to build trust with community members. Nobody wants crisis standards of care, nobody wants triage, but in the event that the demand exceeds the resources, having some degree of trust is fundamental to keeping the uh, healthcare system working. So we learned that engaging with community members early, but on an ongoing basis and really listening and taking to um, account recommendations, um, you have to ensure that it's inclusive and, inclusive and diverse. I think what we've learned um, during this pandemic is that the pre-existing uh, 
um, inequities in our healthcare system have only been exacerbated and highlighted. And so thinking about how we can work towards uh, a more robust evaluation um, of crisis standards of care and inclusion in the planning process, um, that structurally marginalized communities are fearful of discrimination and implicit, as well as explicit bias. Um, and we need to understand that uh, the, Im the impact that um, decades um, and centuries of inequities may have on crisis standards of care implementation, and that messaging around crisis standards of care is complex, that, but it needs to happen. We can't activate and implement crisis standards of care un under a blanket. It affects the public, it affects our patients, and so figuring out ways to communicate that to individuals is not only important for the uptake and, and implementation of crisis standards of care, but also for alleviating some of the stresses related to it. If people understand truly the nature of crisis standards of care, they may be more willing to undertake uh, mitigating uh, circumstances like mask wearing or vaccination um, to prevent uh, the, the impact of that. I think this is where situational awareness is really important when we think about coordination and collaboration. So we've identified challenges associated with staffing and inventory, tracking of equipment and supplies across hospitals and healthcare systems. And we just heard a fantastic conversation about the challenges related to staffing. And we have the same issue related to stuff, ventilators, dialysis machines. And we know that some hospitals may have a lot of resources and other hospitals may not have as many resources. And we, uh, as a healthcare profession, don't do the best at taking advantage of modern technology to really identify where resources are in real time and being able to load balance across a region or a state or across state lines. And I think that type of thinking forward, that type of situational awareness that's adaptive and also real time will be critical in ma making sure that we're not uh, triaging care or rationing, um, rationing resources where there may be an abundance in one area, but not enough in another. So situational awareness, resource sharing and loan balancing are critical to both the planning and implementation of crisis standards of care. That individual facility activations versus regional activations has become a hotly debated uh, topic. While we would uh, like if load balancing is appropriate and done well, that would require that crisis standards of care would be implemented uniformly across a region or state. But we have seen where individual hospitals lack certain resources. And so I think one of the learning points moving forward is how do we support those individuals such that they don't have to move to crisis standards of care in terms of triage uh, when the rest of the system isn't necessarily working, um, marching towards that point. And that, I think there was almost universal agreement that we need certain core ethical um, principles. And in the presentation from our primary webinar, ethics was a common construct that we discussed by which we would make triage or um, triage type decisions or rationing of certain resources, but that we need consistent ethical principles, but recognizing that there has to be flexibility and the individual implementation may actually vary in different areas. When we think about workforce, staffing has evolved as a key driver of resource scarcity over the course of the pandemic. And I think it's really important to highlight that staffing, much like ventilators and physical bed space, is a finite resource and it's not infinitely stretchable. Uh, we can't just keep on adding more patients to nursing loads, physician loads, respiratory therapy loads. We can't ask um, our outpatient providers to come into the hospital endlessly and never be available to um, their outpatients uh, for phone calls. We need to come up with better ideas to support uh, staffing during these long drawn out crises that we're currently dealing with. Clinicians are worried about threats to their individual decision making, especially when some parts of crisis standards of care becomes algorithmic. They're worried about their autonomy and then their moral and ethical duty to the patient. And that's where I think the idea of triage teams really stems. That there has to be transparency and communication to the workforce about crisis standards of care, what it what it means and how it's going to affect them, and that management and hospital administration need to support the workforce through implementation and duration of activation. And that doesn't just mean, you know, ensuring that they have adequate resources. It's also a recognition, and this is from some tabletop exercises uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, where people participating in triage making decisions uh, as an exercise suffered extreme psychological distress. And so we need to be able to support both from a resource perspective, but also a mental health perspective, people that have to make some of these difficult decisions. As we look forward, I think one of the things that I've learned, and, and I think uh, our group is in agreement, that crisis standards of care is not just triage. By triage, I mean allocating scarce resources to some patients and, and potentially not to others. Crisis standards of care is really a deviation from our, from our standard of care, where care uh, to patients is degraded from what we would consider to be acceptable. And it's not just 
allocating to one and not allocating to another. And when we think about that, that line between contingency and crisis, I think becomes more blurred. And that is where a lot of the discomfort arises from uh, clinicians. And so the, the spectrum of crisis standards of care really is one where we have to think about um, you know, our reduction or temporary suspension of non-urgent procedures. We've seen that in many states. Establishing pathways for additional urgent outpatient follow-up. If we need to decompress our hospitals, then we may need to discharge patients early or not admit them at all if they're deemed to be lower risk. And we need to figure out ways to augment their ability to follow up and also provide necessary resources regardless of the ability to pay, such as supplemental oxygen, which has been a major barrier during the pandemic. As I stated multiple times, we need to think about statewide load balancing and, and, and combined hospital transfer systems. Colorado uh, created a crisis standards of care for healthcare staffing um, in, as, as an entity in and of itself, separate from triage. And that's part of this continuum of crisis where we recognize that we're deviating care, it will impact patients and may um, require additional liability and licensure protection. That we may also alter our standard therapies before we start treat full, full triaging. And by that, you know, just thinking about dialysis as a, as a core example, we may shorten dialysis sessions. We may cycle continuous dialysis so that we try and treat as many patients as possible, recognizing that the staffing and the machines are a finite resource. That's before we have to move to formal triage protocol implementation. And so this continuum is crisis. This continuum presents a risk to the moral and ethical duties of, that clinicians have, and also to um, uh, licensure and liability aspects. And so viewing this as a continuum, as opposed to triage being equated to crisis, I think we think is, is critical. This is just an example of where we can imagine the full scope of triage. And so at the beginning of the pandemic, we really thought about ventilators as the really scarce resource limitation. But as this uh, crisis has evolved and as we lost healthcare workers across the field, we see shortages in emergency department staffing, outpatient staffing, um, general medicine wards, nurse staffing, respiratory therapy staffing. Um, we see shortages in medications and equipment that are not related to ventilators. And each one of these uh, red dots is a potential point of triage where you may have to make decisions about who will get admitted to a hospital and who won't, who may get transferred and who won't, who gets admitted to an ICU or who may be downgraded, not that they won't receive care, but downgraded to a step down unit or a floor bed. How do we allocate scarce medications? Um, you know, we've already seen some shortages in some of our uh, immunotherapies for COVID, um, but also for other conditions, not just COVID. Um, and that's the other thing that we're seeing across the country is that non-COVID conditions are also becoming um, increasing and, and putting a strain on hospital resources. And then finally, thinking about reallocation for treatment failure. And so this prior views of crisis standards of care is focused heavily on ventilator allocation. But I think now what we're facing is shortages across the entire system and we have to broaden our scope. And thinking about that, as we realize that multiple resources may be identified, and this is something that we're considering in Colorado, is, is a very broad framework for crisis standards of care from which specific forms of triage may be derived, such as triage scores for ventilators. But asking this idea, thinking of the continuum of crisis that to decompress a hospital, not an ICU, but a hospital, we may identify the lowest risk patients who would potentially do well at home with additional resources compared to the other spectrum where we, for ventilators, we try and identify the patients who um, won't benefit even if they were to receive that, they would die regardless of the ventilator. And working our way backwards, really came up with four core questions that could potentially guide a more global crisis standards of care framework. One, how likely is a patient to survive without the resource being considered? Namely, are they low enough risk, not low risk, but low enough risk that if they don't receive, say, hospital admission, they could potentially be provided care at home with added resources. How likely is the patient to not need readmission or reevaluation without the resource considered? So again, for emergency department admissions to hospitals, uh, survival may not be the key thing. We may be actually focused on uh, having them not represent to the hospital to require more resources. And then number three is really that ventilator question. How likely is the patient to survive even if they do receive the resource? Is this somebody, unfortunately, who has a two-month survival with end-stage cancer. So regardless of the ventilator we provide to that patient, they will be unlikely to survive even in the short term. And then finally, as we think about identifying lower risk patients um, to, for home therapy, 
Do they have access, realistic access to those types of alternate care pathways? Do they have outpatient follow-up? Can they afford it? Do they have outpatient medications? Do they have durable medical equipment um, allowances for supplemental oxygen? And if they don't, maybe that patient is somebody that would be prioritized for inpatient admission. And so recognizing that crisis standards of care is a continuum, but also involves a whole host of um, decision-making points where, that we think about today and we can't yet anticipate what we'll see tomorrow in this pandemic or the, the next pandemic. So how do we think about a framework that can guide both ethically and practically our decision-making? Just closing out, um, I wanna thank the entire group that um, contributed to this, Megan Jane, um, Aaron Serino, uh, Shandine Wood, and, and myself, and Eric Toner and everybody um, that's helped. Uh, Megan and Aaron, unfortunately, could not be here today, but I'm gonna turn it back over to Eric for, uh, um, uh, for some discussions. Thanks, Anish, uh, great talk. Um, I wanna invite Shandine to join us now. And uh, Shandine, do you have any, um, any comments or perspectives, either comments on what uh, Anish had to say or, or your perspectives from out in New Mexico? No, just really excellent comments provided by Anish. So thank you for that. Uh, that really was a group effort and just um, enlightening information all throughout and many things to consider, especially for the impact on the Mexico, the rural state that we have. And we're also a state with really uh, high Native American population that pretty much primarily resides in frontier rural areas. So some of the resources uh, out there in terms of staffing and equipment is dire already. So the impact of a pandemic such as COVID-19 for rural tribal areas is exponentially uh, uh, detrimental to a lot of communities out there. Um, however, some of the communication out there is pretty uh, tight knit and, and consistent in terms of the lack of resources. So there's already this environmental community based uh, mental preparedness for the hardship of what it is like to live out in the reservation. So I think just some of the considerations that are put forth from this group and these series of meetings out to the decision makers and policy makers to really consider some of the federal impacts that can be made to alleviate some of the situations in some of the areas like the reservations, like tribal areas, um, you know, rural states that have less resources. Um, but no, just uh, excellent comments all around and just so much, so many things I've learned coming into this and thank you to everybody. Well, thank you, Ashanding. So we, we got a question um, <clears throat> earlier, a little earlier on um, that I think applies to uh, the discussion we've been having um, most recently. And it, it relates to uh, the idea of triage and allocation of scarce resources. And, and the question essentially is, how do you assess the impact um, of moving resources from one group to another group? And, and so uh, we, we think about, um, moving staffing or canceling, we've talked about canceling elective procedures and moving those resources to take care of the COVID-19 patients. We've talked about it in terms of, of ventilators and other um, equipment. But what we haven't talked about uh, is how we know what the real impact, what the beneficial or harmful impact of doing that is. And I'm wondering if, um, if either of you have thoughts on that. I think that's a great question. Um, I, I think that there are a couple different levels by which to consider that question. The first is how do we evaluate what we're doing in real time? Um, so one, are we achieving the benefit that we want? Are we identifying patients that are likely to survive versus um, may, may not be likely to survive? Or are we um, on the flip side of that in terms of hospital admission and early discharge, are we identifying those lower enough risk patients? Um, and that's actually looking at um, outcomes in real time. I think we need to be tracking patients um, when, we, when we triage, not just waiting until after the crisis is over. I also think we need real-time equity um, uh, evaluations of what we're doing. So um, it, there, we know that there are inequities that are built into our healthcare system um, that, that stand on you know, decades of, of inequities, and they've been exacerbated in the pandemic. We also know that a lot of our scoring systems that have been proposed, um, even the ones that you know, I proposed in Colorado, have inequities. Who's more likely to develop diabetes or heart failure? Um, who's more likely to uh, wait to present um, later in the course of an acute illness? 
um, because may, they may not have outpatient access. And so we need to be evaluating the equity implications of what we're, what we're doing um, and recognizing that people that live in rural areas or in areas with limited resources may be presenting much sicker only because of their healthcare access. And so if they're uh, penalized for, for that, you know, that's a, has a huge equity implication. I think the other question, and we're starting to see this from the beginning of the pandemic, is that by moving, by canceling surgery, by canceling screening colonoscopy, by limiting access to, say, screening mammograms, at the beginning of the pandemic, we are only now seeing the full implications of high, um, uh, the fact that we're diagnosing cancer, um, colon cancer at a later stage, and I think breast cancer at a slightly later stage. And that obviously has impl impl uh, impl implications for you know, hundreds, if not thousands of patients. Um, but the tough part about that is that is a delayed consequence that can never be assessed in real time. Um, I think what we need to be doing now, both, I mean, we're still in the midst of a crisis, but continuing um, further on is to be thinking about how shifting resources uh, affected um, other patients um, in both the uh, short term and long term. And then making, and that has to inform the decisions for the next crisis of where do we, where do, where does it, where can the healthcare system uh, actually flex um, up? Where are the detriments when we actually flex down, say um, canceling certain procedures? Um, and we can, we have to incorporate that information and, and research that must stem from that into planning for the next uh, crisis. Thanks. So an, another question, we're, we're now uh, getting several questions. And, and this one is, is for you, Anoush. Um, and it relates to uh, who makes these triage decisions. And I know you have uh, particular thoughts on that. So why don't you talk to, talk to that? Yeah, um, I think it, you know, there's the uh, large scale frameworks and scores that may be adopted at a state level. And I think you need to be really thinking about key stakeholders involvement in that, those types of big documents. On the ground level, when you're in crisis in a hospital, my personal opinion is that you need to take this away from the bedside care team. I think the bedside care team has an ethical and moral obligation to treat the patient in front of them and can't weigh between their different patients. And so having a, an objective is the wrong word because as healthcare providers, um, all of us involved in healthcare, public health, none of us are objective. We wanna help people as much as possible. But um, you know, having a, a slightly more objective group of people with expertise to make those decisions, I think is, is paramount. So we're not putting undue stress on the bed, bedside clinic, clinical team. Thank you. Shandine, we just have a little over a minute left. Is there anything you wanna add before we close? Yeah, I think one thing that's important for, as a takeaway from the information that we provided for our little uh, section here is um, adherence to the plan in a consistent format across different sites with hospitals, with regions within the state. If you have a consistent implementation of an adopted framework or plan, you do have the benefit of looking at some intermediate outcomes according to how the plan is ex executed, how faithful, how faithfully the, the fidelity of the execution to the adopted plan would give you some insight um, into the more long-term outcomes at, you know, at, at an intermediate level. Obviously, the, out, the long-term outcomes is really going to be hard, nearly impossible to assess. But I think that's just another level of, of adoption that needs to happen rather than a haphazard adoption and implementation of any sort of adopted, uh, you know, loosely understood framework at a hospital versus another hospital. So, um, you know, consistent application of an adopted framework would be one way to sort of standardize the outcomes that are people are, you know, during a pandemic have been subjected to the, or have gone through that, uh, that framework. Um, yeah, I think that'll be a good basis to give you some understanding of your know, intermediate outcomes from an evaluation standpoint. Thank you. Um, well, thank you both for, for your, your presentation and, and discussion in this section. And we are now out of time and time to move on to the next session.